What is up, brothers and sisters? It's Jay Campbell, and you're listening to the Jay Campbell Podcast. Join me for regular deep dives with amazing beings whose work is manifesting a golden age. And remember, you create your reality by your focused thoughts, conscious words, and intentional actions. Raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. Hey guys, what is going on? It's Jay Campbell, of course, the founder of the new Jay Campbell podcast. And I'm very excited today to be joined in studio at the end of the world with my really, really amazing good friend, Dr. Scott Howe from Tier One uh, Health and Performance. And Scott is the director, of course, of Tier One's research. Um, Scott is like one of the world's leading androgen researchers, a badass epidemiologist. I mean, him and I and Keith, Dr. Keith Nichols, of course, um, just did an amazing two-part series podcast on testosterone optimization done right, which by the way, is the, it's the flagship in the industry. And everyone that has watched it has even gotten back to me. A lot of people on my side of the fence have said, wow, man, great job. So anyway, um, Scott, man, it's, it's awesome to have you here today, brother. How are you doing, man? I'm doing good. It's great to see you. It's great. Yeah, great to see you too. So guys, so just real quick. So what we're going to talk about here today, um, you know, again, Scott is the leading androgen researcher in the world. He has a mastery of the studies. Um, this podcast is really for anyone who's using um, testosterone, whether you're using it therapeutically like he and I do, or you are a bodybuilder uh, using super physiologic levels. You know, we're here to talk today about why blocking estrogen, Okay, by using an aromatase inhibitor or a CERM or really anything that blocks estrogen when you're on uh, testosterone is extremely har- harmful to biological systems. And, you know, I've been saying this for people who pay attention to me. And of course, there are many out there who do for a long time now that Scott's the guy that has all the research that conclusively prove that blocking estrogen is terrible. Okay, for your short term and long term health. So, He's here today. Finally, now I finally got him in the studio now to talk about this. He has a mastery again of the research. We're going to go over a bunch of slides here and stuff today. But Scott, before we jump into it, just real quick from a high level, tell us or tell the audience, of course, why blocking estrogen is terrible. Uh, Well, blocking estrogen is uh, terrible uh, because the body has a fail safe, and this fail safe mechanism is the aromatase enzyme in males. And any time that enzyme is interfered with, uh, there's pathology on both ends of the spectrum. Uh, So if you block aromatase in the male that's on uh, TRT, the normal adaptive uh, um, uh, cardiac hypertrophy that happens that is physiological, it's normal, is exacerbated, it increases. When you look at bone tissue, we lose bone mineral density. When you look at the brain tissue, every target tissue the androgens have, estrogen has as well. Right. Tradal, E2. So anytime that that's uh, um, attenuated, estrogen is lowered or blocked, then there's pathology on both sides. It's very protective. Most of the uh, beneficial effects of testosterone on TRT are modulated by estradiol. Right. So why? So then, you know, we'll, we'll go in your slides right now. But um, why is it still such a problem in the clinical community that they don't understand this, Scott? You know, it's it's something I've thought about for a long time, and I have to just uh, revert back to they don't know the literature, they don't have enough time to read the literature, they don't know how to interpret the literature, and they're not looking from a big picture perspective. When you examine the evidence, you have to look at it from the totality of the evidence. What does it say from animal studies, mammal studies, dose escalation studies, things like that, knockout studies, right? human trials, uh, chimp trials, things like that. You, you have to look at everything from the totality of evidence. And, you know, my opinion was based on 10 years of reviewing, compiling case reports from all over the world, looking at observational studies, trials, experiments that were done and in about a 15 year period i compiled nearly 30,000 androgen studies uh, from the early 1900s on and i came to the belief that 
blocking aromatase was very been or, or very harmful in the long term. And I started telling people about it and they looked at me like I had like worms right. growing out of my head. Right. So that's, uh, um, we have to look at the evidence. We can't make it uh, an inference based on a baseline association stuff. So, so let me ask you a really important question. And obviously, you know, as you and I both know, people today are so pressed for time and no one has an attention span, like the attention span of a gnat because of these and whatnot. But just to put it right out there in the beginning, and then you're going to prove this in the science, you know, yes or no, it is your opinion that the majority of professional bodybuilders, and I don't need to mention any names, but very, very popular pros, people who, you know, will recognize worldwide, globally, um, who have died, you know, from, you know, un, you know unexplained or you know, the autopsy said it was polypharmacy or whatever. You, your, your belief is that majority of these guys actually died from the estrogen suppression from high dosages of AIs in addition to the high dose polypharmacy of the drugs, correct? 100%. Right. And I believe that the pathology, if we look at it and we use a rational reasoning and examine the literature, the pathology that we see with all these guys dropping dead from myocardial infarction, um, a heart failure, things like that, it's predicated on blocking aromatase. If you look at the pathology, it is same. It, it's the same across the mammal studies to the human studies. And we're going to look at forensic case reports where uh, guys have actually died. We're going to see the pathology. And it is a diffuse collagen infiltration that occurs with left ventricular hypertrophy. And it happens across the board when estrogen is blocked. Yeah, I mean, it's that simple. So, I mean, I'm glad we put that out there. So yeah, guys, if you're watching this and you're a bodybuilder and you're not even a pro and you're taking whatever to gain 20 pounds and you think that using, you know, one to two to three or whatever the hell these guys are using, Scott, which is insane in and of itself, of an AI to suppress the side effects that you get from a super physiologic dosages of whatever, it's extremely harmful. All right, man, let's go. This is your show. Start, let's start going through some of the slides here. Let's rock and roll. <clears throat> okay, uh, you know, you had mentioned that, uh, that uh, uh, individuals had always, had sort of com always complained about estrogen symptoms guys on TRT, yep. this and that. Um, well, I, I decided to actually break this down a little bit better so people understand that these estrogen symptoms are really just a psychosomatic. They're in your head. Right. They don't exist. So the, the water <laughs> retention. Hold on. Can you say that one more time? Scott, did you say these, these conditions are psychogenic? <laughs> yeah, they are. Uh, they're, they're largely in the individual's head. They really don't exist. And when you actually look at the function of testosterone or androgens, what they do, um, it, it, it makes more sense. So one of the, what do you think is the, um, the largest estrogen symptom that people complain about? Well, I mean, I would definitely say that was number one, of course, water retention. I'm waterlogged. Well, water, and then there's some like moodiness, emotional change. Yeah, I'm imbalanced. Right. Right. Well, okay, we're going to cover both of those. So the water retention is often attributed, attributed to aromatized estrogen. And early on, this guy Kokian, in the early 1930s, as soon after testosterone was synthesized, uh, him and his research group found that the, the key a primary effect of all androgens, testosterone and synthetic androgens, was their keen ability uh, to retain minerals like nitrogen, sodium, calcium, phosphorus, potassium, all that. So uh, nitrogen retention was one of the primary reasons that anabolic steroids were developed. So all androgens, whether you're using testosterone, whether you're using oxandrolone, whether you're using uh, a decadurabolin, these all have effects on sodium, potassium, calcium, and other minerals uh, to retain those. So if we think about it, in the human body, fluid and electrolyte balance are largely mediated by three things. These include antidiuretic hormone, also known as a vasopressin, aldosterone, and atrial natriuric uh, peptide. 
So those are the three that actually modulate this fluid balance. So if you look at the studies, uh, testosterone has been shown to increase antidiuretic hormone uh, by a mechanism dependent on aromatase, right. not 5-alpha reductase. So what does that tell us? It's dependent on estrogen. Another study uh, demonstrated that testosterone inc increases plasma antidiuretic hormone while estradiol decreases right. antidiuretic hormone in a dose responsive manner. So the effect of testosterone to increase water retention, um, it, it, it actually increases that uh, propensity to increase water retention while estradiol actually lowers that. And there was one study that I pulled to prepare for this that uh, showed that testosterone and growth hormone have both independently sh uh, been shown to lower serum aldosterone levels. So a lot of times I've heard guys say, well, it's just because aldosterone is stimulated because that's the primary hormone that works on sodium. But the literature suggests otherwise. And it, it, it suggests that androgen-induced water retention is mediated by a mechanism other than aldosterone, and, or that there is a local activation of, in the kidneys of the renin-angiotensin system. Now, this renin-angiotensin system is something that we will cover several times in this podcast because it underlies much of the pathology that we see. So with that, the same study also uh, revealed that there were no changes in serum antinatriuretic uh, peptide, so AMP. So if testosterone increases antidiuretic hormone that prevents fluid loss and conservation of water, and estradiol decreases it, it really doesn't make sense that water retention is caused by estradiol because uh, in the uh, studies I just went over, estradiol actually has a counter effect to that hormone. So the literature shows that androgen-related water retention is mediated through antidiuretic hormone and local renin-angiotensin system activation in the kidneys. Estrogen is not the problem. And water will resolve in four to six weeks if an individual is on a testosterone replacement therapy, but will recur in anyone if the sodium levels that they intake on a daily basis are too high. So uh, we can't equate uh, estrogen to this water retention problem. Um, so the last, the evasive motor symptoms, you know, I, I thought about this for a while and had to really dig deep um, to, to find some studies that examine this. So vasomotor symptoms are usually what are tested in, in, in females going through menopause, but vasomotor symptoms also occur in men. And they are sort of similar, similar in that they include hot flashes, sleep disturbances, cognitive dysfunction, and emotional and mood disturbances. So a lot of guys uh, tell us on a daily basis that they have moodiness, they feel more emotional, um, and they believe it's estradiol that's causing that problem. Well, Taylor and some other researchers examined two cohorts from a randomized, uh, from actually two randomized controlled trials. And these uh, trials were of hypogonadal men that were assessed to determine the contribution of testosterone and estradiol deficiency to vasomotor symptoms. So they actually examined the moodiness right. and all the symptoms that we talk about. So one cohort received 1.25, uh, 2.5, 5, and 10 grams of testosterone gel or placebo for 16 weeks. And the other cohort received the same increments of testosterone gel, but they added a nastrozole or placebo huh. for 16 weeks. So they found that estradiol deficiency was the key mediator of vasomotor symptoms in these men, and that the incidence of these vasomotor symptoms was greatest in men receiving an AI. Wow. So if estradiol is causing these estrogen-induced vasomotor symptoms that we all hear about, it was not found in two randomized controlled trials. 
Wow. So we have to question this. And it all goes back to Dan DeShane's book that right. he released about that. So, so do you think then, Scott, realistically, based on just, I mean, obviously, you know, that just that's just a sample population group in that study, but do you really think then, because obviously we know that AIs are widespread in use from doctors and from bros, do you think that literally the quote unquote symptoms that they're actually expressing are mostly in, due to the concomital use of AIs and testosterone, both super physiologically and therapeutically? I think so. Wow. I really do. And also, there it is. When, when we go back into it, when we look deeper into oh, androgen oh, abuse, oh. we have to look at progest progesterone receptors. Right. Because those progestogens, anabolics that couple those progestogens too, like Trimbalone, right. they cause massive mood, mood disturbances, right? right? Right, right. It's predicated because of that. Progesterone wow. is used in women as a mood calming effect. And so these together, um, we have to really drill down into what is bullshit and what is not. And I think that um, um, the vasomotor symptoms, um, they are resolved when an AI is not used. So either the individuals have a psychosomatic issue with it or they're lying. That's pretty much it. Yeah. Uh, so, so let's stay there right now because just, just for short term, because I know you have a lot to go, but um, I think this is profound information because I've always said the same thing, right? I mean, both you and I always tell guys all the time, uh, bro, you don't have a need for it. You don't need a microdose. It's psychogenic. I mean, we have thousands of stories, right? But the reality is, is now you've got science, scientific proof that literally proves that suppression of testosterone with the therapeutic use of AI, and as you know, most guys are not using therapeutic in the bodybuilding realms. They're causing all of these actual physiological, so they're not psychogenic, symptoms which then they attribute to being high estrogen symptoms so this is such a morass this is like literally like such like a complicated again it's a swamp you know i use the word morass but it's a swamp of like wow all these things are happening and it's really the ai sprinkled on top of either therapeutic or super physiologic use that's really the culprit causing quote unquote the physiological manifestations well, it is. And then when you step across to the super physiologic group, you have to look at the uh, progestogenic effects of wow. the androgens because that is where it's really coming from. It's not from the estrogen. And any time that you block estrogen, you're going to have pathology. And that's something that we're going to review several times. Unbelievable. So I, I put this on here because I wanted to like set up the stage for exactly uh, what goes on when we actually inhibit aromatase. So E2 binding to estrogen receptor beta and estrogen receptor alpha and cardiomyocytes, it is essential for all males to maintain cardiovascular health. In the absence of E2 binding, the adaptive hypertrophy from androgens is magnified. Wow. And it begins the progression of pathological remodeling in those that even that even those that are on higher doses of TRT and also with anabolic steroid users. So estrogen receptors are also expressed in cardiac endothelial cells, in smooth muscle cells, and they carry out a broad range of benefits to the heart. So estradiol ER binding in cardiomyocytes activates this kinase signaling pathway. And when it does this, it attenuates pathologic hypertrophy of the heart. Wow. So you have a normal adaptive cardiac hypertrophy that all androgens do. And when you interfere with that, you see the figure to the right. When you knock out um, the androgen receptor plus the estradiol, you get a small pathological heart. Wow. Well, when you knock out the aromatase enzyme and you have these same hearts up there, the, the heart will actually look like the wild type over here on the left, but it will still have the same pathology. Wow. When you knock out the estrogen receptor, it will be the same enlarged heart with this collagen infiltration. Wow. And it happens even in the coronary arteries and the aorta. So, Estradiol binding to estrogen receptor beta 
prevents angiotensin II induced cardiac hypertrophy and fibrosis by regulating these histone uh, deacetylacetylases and it inhibits calcineurin. So angiotensin II is the enemy of any man on testosterone replacement therapy or even more so in any bodybuilder. Right. Angiotensin II is an enemy. So we're going to talk about that more. So Scott, what do you say then to the crazy bodybuilders who will attack you and me? Because we're going to be attacked after this show runs. You know that. I know you that. Say, but... <laughs> but so when they say, but Scott, but Jay, if I don't take the AI, I get, you know, I get what you're saying, but if I don't take the AI, I can't, I can't, um, I can't stand the side effects again, which to them is, you know, massive water retention, which again, isn't coming from the AI. Well, it, it probably is coming from the AI now all the proof that you have, but like, so what do you say to them? Like, but Scott, if I'm going to use a gram of testosterone or 600 milligrams of testosterone or whatever it is, what do you say to them to say, if, if, if they know they can't use the AI, do you just tell them then you, you've got to deal with the side effects that happen? Well, no, there's the side effects can be managed, but they have to be managed outside of the estradiol. Right. You, have to, the, you actually have to use your brain and figure out what's going on. So in a lot of uh, situations with um, water retention, Right. In normal TRT level doses, right. it will resolve in about four to six weeks. Absolutely. Unless the individual has a high sodium diet. Right. Here's the thing. In the very beginning of this podcast, I mentioned that the key effect of androgens was retention of minerals. Well, anytime that someone takes a, more minerals than what they need, and when they're, they're taking an androgen, they, they're actually in the surplus of these they actually don't get excreted as much. So uh, that's where the, the thought needs to be. Crazy. So the, another reason that I put the uh, diagram of the ARCO on the uh, right side of the figure was uh, to show that normal cardiac growth is stimulated by physiologic, physiologic androgens is what we strive for in men. We don't want it to go past that when that androgen receptor is knocked out or there is no aromatized estradiol, normal cardiac growth induced by androgens does not occur. And angiotensin II remodeling occurs with diffuse collagen infiltration to the heart and arteries. It, it, it occurs across the board. And what you'll see in the case reports that I show uh, uh, moving forward to several slides, that this becomes more austere is the level of androgens goes up and aromatase has been inhibited. So we're going to touch on that later, but that's the main gist here. Yeah. Amazing. And by the way, you're, you know, just, let's just be honest. You're the first guy that's putting this out there, dude. I mean, there is not, this has not been, I mean, obviously I speculated about it last year because you told me, you know, we were talking about, um, you know, micro fissures, um, you know, in the vascular networks, but I mean, here, you just, you just proved it. I mean, you literally have a slide that proves what's literally happening to the tissue when you knock out the estrogen receptor. It's just, it's incredible, dude. Well, you know, it's really going to hit home when we look at the case reports, because when you see it, I've, I've showed what it looks like now when we knock out one thing in a mammal model. Right. And then we're going to see it when a guy has abused an AI for a decade. It took massive amounts of androgens. And you're going to see a 900 gram heart. Jesus Christ. And you're going to see massive, profuse collagen infiltration. So let me ask you about that. I know you're going to get to it, but because people are going to ask now, and I want to keep them you know, glued to this podcast from this standpoint, is there hope for those guys, Scott? Can they repair that? Can that be fixed like through you know, rehabilitation or through specific supplements or specific you know, um means are, is that is that possible or is that da is that damage permanent some of the effects of uh, pathological remodeling are reversible and i want to make that clear some of the effects are reversible so when it comes to actual co collagen infiltration in the myocardium and between the myocytes and it inhibits the conduction velocity from the apex of the heart up through the purkinje fibers to the apex, 
then you start having problems that can't be reversed. So the thing about it is, if a guy's going to take massive amounts of androgens, he doesn't need to block aromatase. Right. And he needs to use compounds that do aromatize. Right. To prevent that from happening. Because just normal TRT will uh, uh, adapt the heart with right. cardiac hypertrophy. Right. When you couple that with resistance training, you have another stimulus that's above and beyond. Right. When someone has 100 pounds over their normal body weight, that's residual afterload on the heart that causes increased pathology. So it's all accumulative, but there is hope. If guys can figure it out early enough, figure out ways to get around their water retention and the moodiness that they're having, because it's not predicated on estradiol. Awesome. And, and that's what I help people do. Yeah, well, keep going. I don't. I didn't want to interrupt you. I just want to put that out there. And then obviously towards the end too, you'll talk about steroids that absolutely are a no-go that you must avoid versus steroids that you can use that will aromatase. But anyway, continue. We'll, we'll go over six types of uh, 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 toxicity Beautiful. from androgens. So if we really want to see the importance of not blocking aromatase, we have to look at conditions of true aromatase deficiency. It's the only logical way that we can actually see what's going on. Right. So if we look at the brain, aromatase deficiency and knockout studies show that estradiol is neuroprotective and essential to the integrity and survival of a dopamine neurons, a mood stabilization, and normal sexual behavior. Now, if we look at the immune system and the cardiovascular system, estradiol is essential and vitally protective on the immune system and cardiovascular system. So these are like uh, one hand in hand. So if we look at the liver and adiposity, aromatase deficiency correlates closely with negative lipid profiles, adiposity and visceral body fat. The number one risk factor for cardiovascular disease is visceral body fat in right. men. In the absence of estradiol and insufficient estradiol levels, visceral adipocyte number and volume increase. So if we look at the liver, severe hepatic uh, steatosis or fatty liver develops in male aromatase knockout mice as a consequence of this altered lipid uh, metabolism. And this occurs when estradiol is administered and when estradiol is administered to the fatty liver or to these uh, mice with fatty liver, this is eliminated, completely eliminated. So when we have a fatty liver develop, if you actually give estradiol E2, then it goes away. And who would have thought that that would happen? Amazing. So when men with true aromatase deficiency have insulin resistance, in impaired uh, carbohydrate metabolism, this, well, let me restate that. Men with true aromatase deficiency have insulin resistance, it's major, in impaired uh, carbohydrate metabolism. And this is replicated in aromatase knockout models and it leads to metabolic syndrome. So what's the biggest issue that we face today as far, besides cardiovascular disease, we have to look at insulin resistance. So when we knock out, or even in males that are truly uh, aromatase deficient, this develops and it can be easily uh, rectified. So I'm gonna start moving through these. Yeah, please do. So when we look at the lipids, a typical lipid profile of uh, aromatase deficient men is elevated triglycerides, with low circulating high density lipoprotein cholesterol. And this, which fully resolves with the estradiol treatment. So in all the cases that's of uh, um, aromatase deficient men, when they have had elevated triglyceride levels and low circulating uh, HDL, it is fully resolved with estradiol treatment. And over time, this leads to an advancement of cardiovascular disease when the vasculature becomes less reactive. So, uh, when this is left, when this uh, lipid profile that's negative is left to go on by itself, it will advance to cardiovascular disease when we lose reactivity of the vasculature, that ability to vasoconstrict and vasodilate. 
Now, when we look at the bone tissue, men with aromatase deficiency experience increased bone remodeling that is not good, unfused epiphyses, and reduced bone mineral density. And the current body of evidence supports the essential role of estrogen in bone growth and homeostasis in men. So you may take an aromatase inhibitor for one, two, three years, not notice the difference. You take it for a decade and measure by DEXA or some other accurate method, you will see a bone mineral density decrease. So the authors of the last study that I just mentioned, um, they concluded before long-term data is available, it is reasonable to look at current models of aromatase deficiency, and that's what we did with their paper, but we're going to again, as indicators of potential side effects and adverse health outcomes that come along with the use of aromatase inhibitors. So most of the literature points to this conclusion. Optimal cellular physiology of sex steroid target tissues vitally depends on androgen, the androgen to estrogen ratio rather than a single hormone action in isolation. So that androgen to estrogen ratio is very essential. And you hear a lot of guys talking about it, but they use it in the context of controlling estrogen. And I'm going to explain why that is not right. This ratio is controlled in vertebrates by the aromatase enzyme, by the levels at the tissue, and is set through the aromatase gene. Alteration of this ratio in either direction results in pathology to most organ systems. It's been demonstrated throughout the literature in animal mod models, so it's unclear why we still think it doesn't apply to humans. Aromatase is a fail-safe mechanism in men to protect organ systems through the needed levels of estradiol for organ protection relative to the circ circulating levels of endogenous or exogenous androgens. So even with individuals that are not taking anything, you'd never want to block aromatase. And it's even more so great in individuals that take exogenous androgens. So here's the kicker. Only 20 cases of true aromatase excess syndrome and deficiency have been described in the medical literature since 2014. So there is no justifiable reason to block aromatase in men on testosterone replacement or bodybuilders taking massive amounts of synthetic androgens. Right. If there's only 20 cases in the medical literature of excess or deficiency, then where are we getting this idea that we need to modify aromatase? So uh, Jay had uh, presented a question about why the majority of TOT uh, physicians uh, prescribing don't understand the dangers of blocking A2. Now I put what I believe is occurring here um, on the screen. Jay, do you have any input before I run through these? Um, no, I mean, I think we just know that the reality is, is that um, the docs, like as you already said it earlier, we already, I already addressed it. I, you know, I asked you and you said they don't understand the literature. They don't have any time to study the literature. The majority of information that most doctors get on using testosterone comes out of bro, bro science mags, the, you know, the bodybuilding subculture, gyms, people that, you know, look good that they think no. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's unfortunate, but as you and I, and of course, Keith knows, this is just the world that we live in, dude, you know. You and I can go to any medical conference right now and they're still doing fucking lectures on using, um, you know, uh, aromatase, aromatase inhibitor medications for TRT, bro. You know, Dr. G Eugene Shippen is still presenting at major conferences about how using, you know, an aromatase inhibitor drug for actual, you know, HRT. Well, I wonder if he's actually looked at the trials that used aromatase inhibitors. Because every one of them have negative effects. Negative effects on libido, negative effects on uh, quality of life. I mean, uh, people feel like shit when they're on an aromatase inhibitor. And many feel exactly. like shit when they're on HCG. So it's just one of those things. But 
th these are the three reasons that I believe that the physicians that prescribe aromatase inhibitors don't understand the dangers of blocking it. Um, most have not examined literature in the scope that I have or others that are around the world. There's some really, really respectable researchers out there that know the literature better than I do. And I've been at it for like 20 years. But a lot of these guys don't know how to actually interpret the evidence. They see some conclusion in, or see something in abstract, they're abstract surfing, and they take it to mean it's fact. And it's, it, that could be the furthest from the truth of uh, anything. One it's, of the other it's major reasons. It's just, it's crazy. It's honestly, I mean, I, want, I don't want to interrupt you, but you know, just to throw emphasis on it, it's crazy. It I mean, is, the lack it, of awareness is just insane. Well, and it's, uh, it's uh, promoted so much. I mean, if you look at, well, it's on the next one. Uh, the majority of TRT prescribers are T-mills. The more, the majority of these guys in TRT mills promote aromatase inhibitors. So what does a patient do? They look at their website and they have some uh, little crappy write-up that says the estrogen should be at some sweet spot or something like that. And um, the evidence does not support that. So it's promoted by these uh, uh, T-mills and it's just not doing anything good to men's health. But no. the last uh, reason why uh, I, I believe that most prescribers don't know the danger is uh, some of these prescribers actually uh, cater to bodybuilders that need a cruising dose and they shell out these AIs just to make them mad. Right. Exactly. Now, it's a money-making opportunity. There's no doubt. There's well, no doubt. it is. And the whole thing about a TRT mills and the difference between, between what we do here at this practice and other, there's some other really good practices out there. Uh, we're preventive medicine and um, we can't cram people through. We have to look at review of systems. We look at, have to look at their med medical history and we really have to drill down into that. But we uh, categorically do not prescribe aromatase inhibitors here. And there's good reason uh, for that. So uh, Jay had asked me before about how using supraphysiologic doses of anabolic steroids uh, cause damage to uh, biological systems. And I'm gonna step through this and there's gonna be some key points that I'm really gonna drive home. Um, so in my dissertation research, I mapped out these six forms of androgen toxicity. And I did this after a decade of reviewing the literature of case reports, forensic reports, uh, trials, observational studies, the whole nine that I compiled uh, for the past 20 years. Awesome. So four of these were actually mentioned in the literature. They were actually already used. The terminology was already used. And then two of these I actually developed from actually examining the literature and making some uh, connections. So with a cardiotoxicity, this is characterized by a distinct phenotype of injury. And we're gonna walk through that injury here soon. But basically it is a limited capacity to reverse uh, these adverse effects that uh, happen to the heart. But some effects are reversible. And that's an important point that I want to push home to guys that are just picking up anabolic steroid use. You can really screw yourself in the long term if you don't take action and really think about what you're doing now. The second form is hepatotoxicity, and it's characterized by distinct phenotype of injury. And a large capacity to reverse and repair unless the tissue, uh, the actual tissue in the liver becomes scarred or cirrhotic. Now, when we look at nephrotoxicity, it's a little more despair. Um, this usually occurs from uncontrolled hypertension and occurs secondary to androgen-induced liver injury. And this is very bad because the liver uh, uh, is the, it, the liver can regenerate, but not the nephron. So when a nephron is damaged, that damage is pretty much permanent. So we have a limited organ reserve and a limited capacity to reverse tissue damage. And what I wanna say is all the organ systems, for anyone listening, we have a limited organ reserve. And every time that we use a substance, we 
tax that organ reserve. And if you're using anabolic steroids heavily and we, you're using methylated androgens a lot, you can actually tax that organ reserve uh, to the point of kidney failure. So the next is hematotoxicity, and this is characterized by increased uh, red cell number, which in TRT is not harmful. So if you're taking a therapeutic dose of testosterone and no other uh, um, androgens, then this is not pathologic. And some uh, write-ups will call this polycythemia. Some will correctly call it secondary erythrocytosis, but it is not pathologic. And it does not require phlebotomies. So we just had a guy that came in a couple of weeks ago and he was at a TRT mill and they had had him come in every day to give a pint of blood. Well, guess what ended up happening after two weeks of this, he developed iron deficiency anemia. So in guys on TRT, you do not have to phlebotomize. And the whole issue about hypercoagulability is something that I'm gonna be releasing in the literature soon. But it does, it, it, that is a myth. And it's based on association studies, and we'll get back to that later. But real hematotoxicity, uh, it deals with the blood con constituents, and it, it not only involves red cell uh, count increases, but platelet reactivity, aggregation capacity, thromboxane receptor density. Now, a lot of the methylated androgens increase clotting factor activity and suppress other clotting factors while prolonging uh, prothrom prothrombin time, and that's the time to coagulate. So if you're abusing androgens and you're bodybuilding, then you need to look close at hematotoxicity because it, it, in some individuals, it could end up uh, taking your life. So Scott, what is the dosage? And I know it's a rough approximation, but you know, bodybuilders are going to watch this and be like, okay, bro, tell me what I can't go to. I mean, is there a milligram amount of testosterone? Again, I'm not talking polypharmacy. We're not talking about anything else like anabolics or anything that non aromatizables. We're talking about testosterone. In your professional, very expert opinion, is there a dosage amount that you would say stay below milligrams per week in testosterone? I would say that you actually reach the frontier of performance enhancement and abuse when you uh, get to about 25, 2600 nanograms per deciliter. I can't give an external dose because we have uh, these other factors that have a 40% variation from man to man in how they right. actually metabolize. But right. the internal dose load at around uh, 24 to 2500 is more than sufficient for almost every man, regardless of their polymorphisms, regardless of their negative SNPs, um, so if you're going above that, then that adaptive, the normal physiologic adaptive hypertrophy that occurs with physiologic androgens starts to get amplified after that amount. Right. right. So when What's you the highest you've ever seen level wise, by the way, when you guys measuring like, like a guy who was like taking grams of blank a week, have you ever seen it? Like what's the highest that they actually can measure to? Well, you know, I'm not sure about the actual top. I know that. Uh, in literature, um, I've seen studies where guys had taken seven or eight grams a week. <laughs> and it was, I think it was two studies in Europe, maybe Norway, that actually quantified this. And when I, I looked at the studies, I had wow. to do a double take because what they reported wasn't really consistent with the effects that were found with that. Right. So I've personally uh, seen uh, testosterone levels, internal levels, uh, between four and five hundred or four and five thousand nanograms per deciliter. Right. So right. you have to think of, about the uh, how much dose is, is going on there. And usually it's when guys are taking um, um, at least two grams per week. I don't even, I mean, you know, I know friends and you know friends and you know, I know you were a bodybuilder at one time too and look amazing, but like. I mean, I've known guys that have been on three grams of test a week, Scott, and they're like, fuck, dude, you can't sleep. Your central nervous system is so amped. You know, half these guys are taking like GHB or whatever, like just to, you know, to knock themselves out. 
I mean, GHB is one of GHB is one of the worst to actually get hooked on because it's worse than a benzodiazepine. Right. When you start to go through withdrawals of that, it's terrible. And it's oh so easy God. to make that these guys will import uh, gamma burlactone, uh, like floor cleaner and sodium hydroxide, and they'll make it themselves. But the thing about it is, you, it's not, you really have to come to some point in your life where you see that that is not healthy. That if you're having to take GHB to knock you out and it's used for narcolepsy as an actual treatment, that you sort of went over the boundary. So, um, <laughs> interesting stuff here. Uh, now, the last uh, um, type of toxicity that I mapped out in my dissertation research was vasculotoxicity. Right. And this occurs to the arteries and veins. And so, this type of toxicity is characterized as a loss of vascular reactivity. So what happens when cardiovascular disease starts to develop? We lose vascular reactivity, that ability to vasoconstrict and vasodilate. So when our actual vessels start to get hardened, they don't react like they used to. They're not as responsive to nitric oxide. Um, then that's when pathology starts to occur but also endothelial injury. Now, massive doses of anabolic steroids increase reactive oxygen species in all the tissues. So what happens with that? Well, with your vascular system, you can actually get acute or even chronic endothelial injury. So what is the impetus when someone develops a thromboembolism or they develop something like that? When a, a thromboembolic event happens, it is the intersection between hematotoxicity and vasculotoxicity. And this creates the conditions of endothelial injury and hypercoagulability. And it's only conditions of abuse. And it often results in stroke, pulmonary embolism, venous thromboembolism, when the blood flow is altered. So we have to have three or four components that occur at one time. And when there is stasis, it means the blood is restricted to flow. When someone has an injury and they go to the hospital or they uh, are laid down for an illness or something like that, when that blood flow starts to slow and all these other mechanisms are there, then if you're taking massive amounts of these drugs, then um, you have a, a very high risk of developing thromboembolism disorder. So the last, uh, and I covered these out of order purposely, the last is neurotoxicity. Now, a lot of guys that I've talked to in the bodybuilding world uh, sort of just shrug this off. Um, but you know what? There is substantial evidence in neurotoxicity, and it is characterized by a phenotype of altered cognition and stimulation of the amygdala and increase beta amyloid and hyperphosphorylated tau protein levels. Now, uh, Jay, do you, the, do those uh, proteins, beta amyloid and tau proteins mean anything to you? <laughs> of course, Alzheimer's. Exactly, so uh, Pope and the uh, Harvard group released a study that I'm gonna uh, cover here soon but beta amyloid and tau protein accumulation is thought to begin soon after initiating superphysiologic doses of, of uh, uh, anabolics. And it's made worse by cycling on and off. So if you cycle on and off, this uh, beta amyloid plaque develops quicker than if you just stayed on continually. And beta amyloid accumulation may be accelerated by other uh, psychogenic subs substances. Um, and you know, a lot of substance abuse goes on in that community. It just does. Like Jay had mentioned a second ago, our guys have to take GHB to go to sleep. Well, it, then it starts to um, become a snowball effect and other things are used. So the interesting part about all these toxicity forms is that 
I have identified specific phenotypes of toxicity in each of these categories. I have about five or six phenotypes for heart, liver, kidney, um, the central nervous system, and the blood in the vasculature that I mapped out. And it's taken me over 10 years to do this. And each form of toxicity has a direct injury component through reactive oxygen species. So in the initial, uh, when I was reviewing the literature 10 years ago, and I was looking at direct oxidative damage, tissue damage, when guys would apply all these different androgens to these uh, different cell types, I was like, well, I started tearing those studies apart because they didn't control for this or that. And then I really started thinking about it inside a physiologic synth, uh, system. And now we have some in vivo studies that show that this oxidative tissue damage does occur. So in anyone that's using high doses of these androgens, you have to take preventative action. Yeah. And that's something that we'll get to um, uh, close to the end. So when I mentioned that there was distinct tissue damage, uh, there is a distinct phenotype of hepatotoxicity in the liver uh, with methylated oral steroids. It's so Scott, real quick on that, just real quick on that, because I know you're, you're going to say, and I, I think most people know that obviously that the methyl alkylation of oral stuff is bad, but to dispel shit right now, is there any in your copious understanding, uh, research and, and voluminous understanding of what you've read, is there ever any hepatoxicity from injectable testosterone? I've seen liver enzyme increases in a couple of studies on injectables that were not 17 alpha alkylated in any position. Right. You can methylate something not only in the 17th position, but it, it, you can do it in other positions on the sterin nucleus. But I have seen liver enzyme increases. And uh, I believe one study linked that back to the hydrolysis of the enzyme in the liver. So the ester has to be uh, go through hydrolysis in the liver uh, to uh, chop off all those uh, carbon atoms to be release the hormone. So as far as um, uh, hepatotoxicity, no, just the elevated enzyme levels in the liver um, uh, for uh, some injectables, but not across the board. It's not uh, something that's major. So most all uh, hematotoxicity uh, comes through that, or hepatotoxicity comes through uh, methylated oils. Does that answer your question, Jay? Yeah, I think so. Well, there's also a, um, now this, uh, there's also a distinct uh, uh, type of hepatotoxicity that also leads to nephrotoxicity. And it's a form of drug-induced liver injury that's characterized by considerable bilirubin levels independent of damage or type of magnitude that predominates acute kidney injury in cholestatic cases. And these cases all have uh, pronounced uh, jaundice. So if you have an acute uh, kidney injury, most often if someone is abusing anabolics, they're taking an underground a version, some underground pro-hormone sup, uh, supplement that is methylated. And it causes the liver injury first, but then it leads to bowel cast nephropathy. And it damages the tissue that way, but it is characteristic. And most often the cases will have jaundice, but there's also a distinct phenotype of cardiotoxicity. And this right. cardiotoxicity is one of the ones that I'm really passionate about because it is one of the ones that are really laying uh, uh, professional bodybuilders down. Right. There is diffuse collagen infiltration, there's left ventricular hypertrophy, and there's a decline in cardiac function that's more pronounced with non-aromatizable androgens huh. than aromatizable androgens. So each step that we've been talking about, I've been given clues about what people can do to prevent some of these things. So when we talk about estrogen, it also goes into uh, compound selection as well. So one key point to mention, and I touched on this earlier, is that some, but all, not all, cardiac changes can reverse. 
and they can be prevented by several key, t key steps. However, some cannot be reversed once they occur, especially this pathological remodeling with collagen. So um, I'm not gonna cover the SARS because I think it will take us uh, too long with the time. Right. So I'm gonna start, just jump right into the uh, toxicity modes. So this uh, figure on the left shows how abnormal androgen levels cycling on and off with high doses interact with excess oxidative stress, various proteins, and synthesis of beta amyloid, beta amyloid elimination, and tau protein phosphorylation in relation to developing Alzheimer's disease and its related dementias. Now the Pope group did this, and a lot of people critique uh, 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 Skip Pope and uh, criticize what he has done. This man has studied illicit androgen use from the late 1970s. Wow. He, on the, on the year I was born, he actually went and testified for a correctional officer that was accused of murder that had been taking anabolic steroids. And so I have a lot of respect for the uh, uh, Harvard group, but I do not think that they uh, catch everything. So I, I give kudos to Skip uh, and his group, but uh, we're gonna move on. Now the figure on the right shows a vertex-wise comparison of cortical thickness between a control group and the red box that I've outlined and various uh, anabolic steroid user samples. So the shades of blue here indicates clusters of thinner cortexes in the anabolic steroid using groups. In this study, there was a negative correlation between brain volume and cortical thickness. So if you look at this and they imaged these studies and actually found the functional decreases, uh, cognitive decreases in anabolic steroid users beginning at 5, 10, years and later of use, then you have to really think about what you're using and what the long-term effects are. So this slide is a case of a 29-year-old bodybuilder that presented with mid-gastric pain with visual hepatomegaly. I mean, you look at this guy's stomach. We see a lot of bodybuilders with extended stomachs. This guy, he's not too fat, but you can see that, um, he has um, a hepatomegaly, and this is a, the top left photo. Now, if you look at the ultrasound on the right, it showed a pattern uh, with signs of hepatocellular carcinoma. So that was an ultrasound that was done. So they did a biopsy, and this is the left figure of this slide, and it established the diagnosis of beta-catenine protein. It's the figure at bottom, A, left and androgen receptor positive hepatocellular carcinoma in the bottom left figure B. So here and here, catenin here and uh, androgen receptor positive here. So this, if I, I looked at the mass of this guy and he had to actually have a liver transplant and he was a competitive bodybuilder. He had to have a liver, a complete liver transplant because of this, wow. but his, his, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma was androgen receptor positive. So every time he took androgens, it made it worse. So not only do methylated androgens cause this type of liver toxicity, now case reports of SARMs have come out. And wow. I just, I received I the first case, case reports of SARMs inducing liver injury. Of course. That was just reported by Flores and that was 2020. It was just a month ago. And so I see that I'm thinking, you know, these guys think that SARMs and all these guys that promote SARMs are safe. There have really not been any long term studies of all Scott, those. Truthfully, I already, I want to say this. I'm glad you brought this up. I want to say this. I did not put any SARM in the TOT Bible because I already knew they're least, they're less effective and more inhibitive. And yeah, I didn't have any of the data on the damage long-term, but I already knew that they're garbage. It's just another scam put forth by Big Pharma, which obviously then admitted that they were orphan drugs, right? Because they abandoned them. Yeah. And then of course, of course, the chemical you know, research community, whatever you want to call them, the research chemical manufacturers, salt were like, oh, 
you know, look what it does and all that. And I always knew, dude, because I knew, you know, guys, I knew guys, it's, they're bullshit. Now, there are a couple that do a couple of good things, but they're not going to replace testosterone, especially from a cost standpoint and a health and safety standpoint. So anyway, I wanted to just say that. Well, you know, it even goes further than that. And as far as the effects, if you, nothing is going to compare with the androgens that have been developed since Cokian all the way up to the present day. Right. There's nothing going to compare with right. the androgens in terms of nitrogen retention. Right. In, exactly. the, in the early night or late 1930s, the thought about developing anabolic steroids occurred, but that name didn't get dubbed until the 1940s. Um, but the whole issue was about nitrogen retention because they wanted to use this in wasting diseases. And that's why they went on this hell spree of developing uh, so many anabolics. But no SARM is going to equal the anabolic steroids that have been developed, hands down. So, and in, even some researchers have tried to uh, post classify Trembolone as a SARM. Well, okay, I, I may get a couple of points about uh, progestogenic activity and things like that, but no, it is a handbox steroid. So this slide is examining um, the nephrotoxicity. Uh, and I pulled two of these um, because it's a, it, a distinct phenotype. So the two figures on the left show that one nephrotoxicity phenotype of severe coleostasis in the liver and bile acid nephropathy that had to be treated with plasma phoresis. And a 31 year old lifter that had used two methylated orals for about uh, 60 days in the case report. So the top left figure shows the inflammatory infiltrates with acute hepatitis and hepatocyte necrosis on liver biopsy. That's what you're seeing here in A. The bottom left figure here uh, shows the aluminal uh, bile cast that caused the bile cast nephropathy. So this is a phenotype of kidney damage that's predicated on uh, previous liver damage. So the top right figure over here to the left shows a liver biopsy and it shows the nephrotoxicity phenotype that starts with marked intrahepatic uh, cholestasis and inflammatory infiltrates in a liver biopsy. So when you pull this up and you see this, you know what this is, the cholestasis, there's mild inflammatory infiltrates, and you know what's gonna occur in the kidneys in the section below. So the bottom right figure shows mesangial deposits. And this is characteristic of immunoglobulin A nephropathy of the kidney. And what this means is that uh, it was hepatitis A um, infection that had developed antibodies and this was bile cast. But all this comes together and is characteristic. And the kidney failure was secondary to liver failure caused by the methylated androgen Superdrol. And this guy actually bought Super it. Superdrol. He bought it over the counter. So <laughs> I remember. Of, they sold it in GNC. They did. And the thing about it is, that was one of the strongest methylated versions of an androgen that was developed in the 50s, 60s, 70s. I know. I remember what Bill Phillips said about it. It was one of those loophole drugs that made it through. Because again, the FDA, you know, again, it's a, you know what it is. It's a loophole drug and it made it through and these assholes sold it. Wow. Unbelievable, dude. Well, you know, even the guys that had sold DMP in the United States. Right. Do you know what I have the most case reports about? No. DMP. Yeah. I mean, I know, I, believe me, I know how lethal DMP is. Uh, DMP, and you see these videos of these guys uh, uh, taking DMP and talking about the merit, merits of it. And they just really are so stupid to think that normal people can differentiate between a toxic dose and it being so close to a lethal dose. So, I mean, 
if you want to look at a lot of case reports, look at DMP um, uh, fatalities. So this slide was sort of interesting because it's a sort of a merger between vasculotoxicity and hematotoxicity. And this uh, slide is of a 31-year-old bodybuilder that was on Winstrel, Nandrolone, Testosterone, Propionate, and Clenbuterol and developed an ischemic stroke. So that's over here, this guy. So the middle figure shows uh, femoral artery occlusion in another anabolic steroid user here. So the femoral artery, we know where that's at, the right leg, it's occluded here. And that's a big occlusion. Now the right figure shows a a spherical thrombus in the left heart ventricle of another, a, another young anabolic steroid user. So these are three separate case reports, one in the uh, brain, one in the right femoral artery, and one in the heart where a thrombotic, uh, thrombotic embolic disease uh, actually occurred. So these events occur with this. So these examples, all three of these examples typify when hematotoxicity and vasculotoxicity overlap. So if you really look into what I've written about vasculotoxicity and hematotoxicity, you will understand the danger in some of the drugs. You hear some guys saying, oh, well, if you don't go over 100 grams, you're good. Well, no, you better have your genetics genotype and you better know what you're taking because of some of these individuals, you'll end up just like this. So um, that's all I have for that one. So this figure shows phenotypic cardiovascular pathology of the hearts of four fatalities, four chronic and high dose androgen users that likely took aromatase inhibitors. So if you look at the first column right here, this first column down, this shows the major fibrosis in all the four hearts. If you look in the second column, it shows the extent and severity of interstitial fibrosis. If you look in the third column, it shows almost completely enclosed small arteries. So these arteries, the small arteries are almost completely closed, but when you jump to the fourth column, it shows that none of these cases had atherosclerosis at the coronary artery level, but they had blockages below that. So this is a phenotypic example of high dose androgen use with when individuals are blocking aromatase. Now we start looking at some of the major pathology slides. Now this left figure shows concentric left ventricular hypertrophy of a heart of a 32-year-old bodybuilder and chronic anabolic steroid abuser. Now, what is interesting here, the phenotypic collagen infiltration, this is what it looks like. And it's shown this, uh, um, I, I can't see the actual, uh, what they stained it with, but this is typical of what happens and what's bad. Now, if we look at the right heart, this shows severe cardiomegaly. This heart weighed 900 grams. Now, a typical heart has a max out of around 400, maybe 450 at the biggest, even with uh, athletic training and stuff like that. This heart weighed 900 grams, and it had uh, um, eccentric biventricular, bi biventricular hypertrophy. So both ventricles were hypertrophy. And this guy was 31 years old and he was a chronic anabolic steroid user. And so this guy is almost like a model for using AIs, having a genetic predisposition for cardiac disease and still taking the drugs anyway. So if you look at the stain slide and in C up here, this shows the diffuse collagen infiltration leading to this phenotypic interstitial and replacement fibrosis. So this is what I'm talking about that cannot be reversed 
once you get fibrosis, once you get collagen infiltration, even in on the other slide, once you start to get this to happen, it cannot be reversed. So you need to think before you use this stuff, you need to think about blocking aromatase. So you had asked me, Jay, what it, is really causing the deaths of professional and aspiring professional bodybuilders. Right. I came up with four main reasons that bodybuilders are dropping dead at a younger age. The first is cardiac pathology that is caused by chronic st strain because of pressure or volume overload through uncontrolled hypertension. Right. Uncontrolled hypertension. And this is caused by a system act activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And what happens when this system gets activated, angiotensin 2 and 20 heat occur. And I'm going to explain those soon. Angiotensin is very bad for anyone because it causes damage to every organ system. 20 heat is predicated on angiotensin 2. So, we have to figure out a way to deal with angiotensin. And I have a way that's already been figured out. The second reason, chronic aromatase inhibition that prevents E2 to counter the pathological hypertrophy and collagen remodeling by binding to ER beta. ER beta is where collagen infiltration occurs, but also ER alpha because there's protective effects there. The third, residual cardiac strain by carrying 50 to 100 pounds more than your genetic set point of weight and meeting the tissue oxygenation requirements of this unnatural amount of tissue on a daily basis. I don't know if any of you have actually talked to professional bodybuilders. Walk up a flight of stairs with them. Right. They right, will totally come winded. out of breath. Totally winded, yeah like they're obese. Right. That is not healthy <laughs> on any stretch of the imagination. You think? <laughs> your, your heart is developed for a certain DNA profile. Right. And when you push past that, you're pushing the limits of your health. And the last is resistance training. Resistance training will uh, produce an athlete heart. But when you take anabolic steroids, all the literature suggests it exacerbates that effect. So it will, be even more pronounced. So, let me go back to this. One thing that I want to cover before we leave this, and I put this on the screen again. Uh, we sure. uh, did it one time before. Uh, cardiac uh, remodeling results in changes in the size, shape, and function of the heart. So what I'm concerned about is this pathological remodeling. Physiologic remodeling with uh, just normal serum androgen occurs in athletes and is not considered pathologic. However, when resistance training and high dose androgens are combined, left ventricular hypertrophy and overall hypertrophy of the heart is exacerbated. Now that's what is known by the literature. So, there have been many studies that have shown that anabolics activate the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And this, if anyone doesn't get anything out of this podcast except this, I hope you clearly listen to what I say in the next 10 minutes, because this is the major information. Angiotensin II plays a key role in physiologic uh, uh, control of blood pressure, fluid, and electrolyte homeostasis. Angiotensin II causes tissue damage in the form of necrotic cardiac arterial renal lesions. It inhibits fib fibrinolysis. It stimulates the formation of reactive oxygen species and induces apoptosis. Angiotensin is a bodybuilder's nightmare. And it has a critical role in cardiac pathology. So basically, endogenous angiotensin II is regulated by the opposing action of two 
peptides. And I'm not going to go through with that, uh, through the whole system of how it's elevated. What I want you to know is that when you take anabolic steroids in extreme doses, you are stimulating this system constantly. Right. Unless you take action to deal with this system, you're screwed. Now, if we look at the effects here, myocardial remodeling, fibrosis, hypertrophy, necrosis, apoptosis, direct effects of angiotensin II, vascular remodeling, fibrosis, increase in reactive oxygen species, pro-inflammatory cytokines. It's, it has a tendency to cause arrhythmias, vascular endothelial dysfunction, systemic hypertension, Glomerular, glomerular damage. This is in the kidney. The same dysfunction that causes proteinuria. All these things in the middle of the section are here are about the kidneys. Now, when we look at the baroreceptors, heart rate increase, increase in, in sympathetic tone, heart rate increase, salt appetite, increased thirst. And then you see the, uh, the minerals that are, are, are uh, altered here. Angiotensin and the region angiotensin aldosterone system are the main impetus behind the pathology beyond blocking aromatase. When we look at androgen-induced hypertension, there are two main culprits for cardiac pathology in bodybuilding. Uncontrolled hypertension caused by elevated angiotensin II levels and low estradiol levels because of blocking aromatase. So, uh, uh, Jay had mentioned that I need to give some information about how to prevent some protective strategies. Well, if you're not on the ACE inhibitor then and using anabolic steroids, then uh, you're really not up to the speed with what is shown in the literature. ACE inhibitors prevent the conversion of angiotensin 1 to the detrimental angiotensin 2. You better take it. Angiotensin 2 receptor blockers prevent angiotensin 2 from binding to its angiotensin receptors. You better take one of those right. if you're going to abuse androgens. So where, where do they get them? ACE inhibitor like Losartan is like, it's been actually studied with anabolics in the literature. There's been four or five studies that have used spironolactone, they've used uh, different ACE inhibitors uh, like Losartan, other one, lisinopril, things like that. And they have all shown that these guys, that animals can, can be given massive doses of androgens. So how many pro bodybuilders right now, Scott, do you think are actually on this path, in your opinion? I'd say about five, 10% actually have have thought about it, have some medical training, and can actually look and see. Um, so are there, is there anybody like you coaching these guys about this, truthfully? I don't see anyone out there who's actually using the literature to say, hey, we need to change this. And, you know, recently I started doing that, and I worked with a couple of guys, and it to me, when they give me information about what's going on, in that area, it really boggles my mind that more people are not on to the path I am. And I guess it takes looking at the literature as long as I have to actually see where the connections are. But blocking aromatase and not using the aromatase or a, a ACE inhibitor is heresy to me. If you're a competitive bodybuilder and you come to me and you're not taking an ACE inhibitor, I'm going to tell you, you are fucking stupid. <laughs> keep on taking that without an ACE inhibitor. I'm glad that's how you say it. Right. There you go. That's the only way that I can say it. And when we look at hypertension, a lot of guys, uh, bodybuilders, they, they, they forget about hypertension because in a lot of guys, it's, they're asymptomatic. They don't feel it. Every once in a while, they might get a headache or whatever. But when it's elevated, that is what damages the kidneys. When your kidneys start to malfunction, everything else goes astray. Now look at how many bodybuilders that had kidney transplants. Look at Flex Wheeler. Look at uh, Long. Right. Both had kidney replacements. Right. And 
so these things are, are accumulative. You cannot keep on taking these things this long and then have this fibrosis develop in the heart, lose that contraction velocity, and think you're going to reverse it. You have to take preventative action. And that's one of the things I've really tried to talk about with guys. And, you know, it's almost like I'm banging my head up against the wall uh, because a lot of guys, they're skeptical and they think that you're just bullshitting them on everything. But to be honest with you, I, I started in bodybuilding. Right. And I became obsessed with the adverse effects. And that's right. the only reason I'm sitting here today. Right. Right. It's awesome, man. Well, when we look at uh, this, uh, what we have on the screen, angi angiotensin 2, um, it really influences everything. And one of the reasons why guys develop androgen-induced hypertension, they can't be resolved. And you go to a PMD and they say, oh, it's idiopathic, and they just put you on whatever. It's because the androgens work on a certain pathway. And they stimulate 20 heat. And 20 heat is derived from aerodonic acid. And it goes through the pathway that you see here. And the simple way uh, to deal with this, angiotensin 2 increases the synthesis and release of 20 heat in the kidneys. And it can be stopped by taking an ACE inhibitor. So to just completely nullify anything that's on the screen right now, you can completely sidetrack this by take, uh, taking responsibility for your health and taking an ACE inhibitor, hands down. So when I said angiotensin II was a, the, one of the main problems, it really is. Now, back to the second problem. Now, angiotensin II, um, is responsible for all the major organ pathologies. Regardless if you take androgens or not, it's exacerbated by androgens. But estradiol has many protective effects on many organ systems, many organelles throughout the body, cardiomyocytes, endothelial cells, smooth muscle cells. And you know, it's always said that testosterone stimulates nitric oxide release. I hear that all the time. Well, guess what else does too? Estradiol does. So estradiol is very protective to your heart. It promotes uh, angiogenesis, vasodilation. Um, it attenuates the pathological uh, collagen infiltration, that type of fibrosis that occurs, and it also reduces oxidative stress. So blocking aromatase in a competitive bodybuilder is akin to giving someone a five to 10 year death warrant. Right. So if you want to do this, go ahead. You're going to die within five to 10 years. Block it, ax it out, roll with it and see what happens. It's not going to be good. So my main point in saying that is these things can be fixed in a lot of guys. So Estradiol is an anti-hypertrophic sex steroid. Right. So it completely ameliorates the angio two, uh, angiotensin two, um, adverse effects on the heart. It prevents cardiac fibrosis through ER beta um, action. It regulates histone uh, to prevent a, a cardiac hypertrophy through ER beta. And it counters the negative effects of angiotensin too. It does it across the board. So now I've shown it, and I hope someone will pick on to it. Uh, let's see. Estradiol attenuates uh, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system pathology. Now, this comes out of a study. You know, a lot of times I talk, and people are like, well, you know, I don't see it in the study. I've <laughs> underlined it for you. Estrogen has been shown to attenuate the pathogenic effects of the RAS system on pathologies. You got a study for that, bro? <laughs> I wrote a whole write-up, about 20 pages for this podcast, with references and everything. And that's what I was rushing for before we uh, first signed on. Oh, but sometimes awesome. it takes people seeing stuff in print right. to think that you're not bullshitting. And right, right, right. it's very important. So... 
Principles of harm reduction. Well, this is something, um, do you have anything, uh, Jay? No, I mean, this is all epic, dude. I mean, obviously the evidence speaks for itself. Well, I, you know, I looked at this for a long time and um, I decided that I had to educate people. And then I had to look at their risk assessment. So I had to take a more elaborate medical history than anywhere else. And so the medical history that I've developed is about, takes about two hours to complete. And it covers every organ system. And I focus on the toxicology part, the uh, structural um, activity relationships of all the different androgens that are out there and their effects on the organ systems. And so I've mapped all of these out and I've developed genetic tests uh, to measure risk and do an advantage analysis to see what you could use and what you shouldn't use as far as androgens. And I've, I've developed and worked with some individuals to come up with, uh, to merge toxicology with some uh, databases on polydrug interactions. So the biggest thing that I see, or one of the biggest things that I see is that guys are taking stuff they don't tell you about. But if you measure it and you test for it in urine, you'll find it or the blood, you'll find it. So some, some of these contraindications are really big uh, and they can cause someone to kick the bucket really quick. So uh, what I do, I use a bioinformatics database, uh, several of them, and I actually run them through th that bioinformatics database and also a toxicology database to look for contraindications of everything the individual uses because it's very hard to do it manually. And so I ask all my clients to be completely upfront and honest with me. And then I sort of suggest and um, giving them advice on what they should monitor. I also do DNA testing now. I've been working with Vanderbilt Medical and I've developed custom panels. And so I do specific genetic testing for androgen metabolism, estrogen metabolism, all the things that I think are important. So I can look at polymorphisms that a regular SNP analysis can't look at. And I can actually make a judgment whether you will respond to lower anabolic steroids than the next guy. Awesome. And so what I do is I put together a complete report. I look at the person's genetics and then I help them make informed decisions, informed decisions that protect their health. And then we map out some pre preemptive strategies to protect your health and what they should do. And um, I, I'm not gonna uh, uh, make myself out to be arrogant, but I do know this literature more than almost anyone. I will though, dude, I will. I'll make sure that people know that you're the guy. I mean, I've been saying it for a year already, dude. I mean, obviously, you know, you and I haven't had this podcast. It's probably six months overdue, but whatever, everything comes in due process. There's no coincidences and you know, if the world doesn't end, and I'm, I'm betting it doesn't, then, you know, this information is going to be, I mean, massively helpful and productive for a lot of people around the world, you know, coming out. And obviously, you know, this is just going to be like kind of the, the gatekeep. I'm kind of the gatekeeper for you to even, you know, reach people with even bigger platforms like Ben Pikulski, like Dave Palumbo, you know, who both want to talk about this information. So, I mean, again, this has been so, you know, profound. I mean, I know you got a couple more slides, but I, I definitely wanted to put that well, out this is This is almost the end here. Um, all the other stuff is afterwards. It's extra stuff that I put in. But the uh, thing about it is, when we first met, Jay, it was all about helping men. Exactly. And I really believe in helping guys. Right. But, I mean, they have to, like, listen at some point. Right. Right. Well, they got to stop lying too, as you guys have told, you know, said, and obviously I know people that are on drugs and, you know, they're ashamed of their, what dosages or whatever, but it's like, until they tell you the truth, right? Like what is the pathophysiology? What is the pharmacology? What have you really been taking and using? And, and, and don't BS me, you know, that you can't help them. So, you know, I think if anything, a guy who's a bodybuilder pro or not, or aspiring, and you're using massive amounts of whatever, and they watch this podcast, they should feel comfortable and obviously confident that they can reach out to you in lot, you know, with no judgment and they can sit down with you and have a professional, intelligent, well-reasoned conversation about how they can receive help. And obviously you're way beyond, you know, the, the typical 
you know, clinician, as you said, in the windmill clinics, that a lot of these guys have unfortunately had only access to. And now that's changing. And obviously this is going to get out there and a lot more people are going to have access to, you know, the only thing I would say is like, dude, are you, uh, are you and Keith ready for the overload? <laughs> well, you know, um, <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm ready for it, but <laughs> the, you know, I have a, a sweet spot for bodybuilders. I do because I've, I lived it for a decade and I used those drugs for a decade. And uh, when we think about, we come to certain points in our life when we think about what is really meaningful. What I see is happening with a lot of guys, they get stuck into this. I'll take anything that I have to take to get by, to put on more muscle. Right. It's not always the best strategy. And, you know, I really started thinking about it. I'm like, well, you know, there's all these things that can be done and they should be done. And anyone can reach out to me and I'll be brutally honest. I don't have any judgment. Uh, and I have a, uh, about a 20 forms that have to be filled out, but we would look at every organ system and we run through everything. So it's awesome. That's awesome. Once a person comes to me there, uh, I'm going to check every organ system. We're going to go through everything and we're going to actually map out uh, strategies that are, have been shown in literature to work. All right. So let's so, summarize this. Cause I'm going to end up doing this into two parts. Cause it's probably about the same thing. It's kind of like an hour, I think in like 34 minutes, but um, and it'll sure. be perfect. It'll be two 45 minutes. It'll be perfect. Perfectly consumable of people. So to summarize this, Never block, and obviously you, you get the final say of it. Never, ever block your estrogen. Never, ever, 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 never, no matter what. Now, I know there are docs out there like Dr. Rob, and I've heard some other guys that have said stuff about, you know, there are very weird, strange, you know, outliers where there are clinical indications where you put a man who's like obviously morbidly obese or something like that on a very, very, very micro dose of an AI, and then you titrate them off immediately once you get inflammation down and stuff. So I, I hate saying never, 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 because there's always outliers, but in most instances, do not block estrogen. Um, as, as you go through and you start looking at guys that are, that are pro bodybuilders who are taking polypharmacy, mega dosages of all these different things, it's critically important not to block it, and they should be using an angiotensin inhibitor, one of the four or five meds that you talked about that are obviously, we'll summarize in the podcast, what did I leave off? You know, um, I think you pretty much covered it all. The, the, do not block estrogen. If you are a competitive bodybuilder, right. choose aromatizable androgens to use. Do not uh, try to stay away from non-aromatizable androgens. So why don't you list those, Scott? We might as well just break it completely down. You know, what what should they not use versus what they should use? Again, because we know guys are going to break, you know, they're going to take anabolics, whatever. What should, What is best versus what they should absolutely avoid? Well, you know, um, for that, I would have to have, uh, I would actually have to have more time. It's something that I do in, in consultations. I break down, I do uh, different things, but it's basically, if it's aromatizable, Got it. There is some form of estrogen that can bind to those ER beta receptors. Right. Those ER beta receptors are involved with the cardiac pathology that we've seen with Rich Biana, right. with Dallas McCarver, all those guys. And I heard some of these physicians reviewing his pathology report and they were so fucking far off base <laughs> that it just blew my mind. I'm like, you're not understanding what the fuck is going on. Yeah. Angiotensin 2 is the killer of bodybuilders along with estrogen, right. estradiol. Right. Estradiol counteracts the effects of angiotensin right. two. Right. But you still have to take an ACE inhibitor to fully protect yourself. Right. So anyone is listening. Those two things, if you will hold on to them, look at the literature, and I challenge you to challenge me on what right. I presented, and I will respond to you. Uh, you uh, contact me through the tier one website and I will interact with you and I will tell you, and I will show you even more studies. We only hit the tip of the iceberg. I right. had to put this together really quick and sure. you know, I have to give kudos to you, Jay, because you really do care about men. Yes. And it's been one of the things that, uh, that has been common. And I am thankful that you've had me on to actually help some guys because thank, I know thank that you God, are dude, this is long able. overdue. This is long overdue. And truthfully, you and I are going to be, I haven't told you this yet, but I'm just telling you now, we're going to be doing more short videos 
and we're going to be putting them up on like specific questions as they come into me. I'm just going to email them to you and you're going to come up with the answer and then we'll do a quick video. Cause as you know, most people today, again, they have no attention spans. They want a five minute, eight minute, 10 minute, 12 minute video, whatever. So right. we'll do, we'll do more of those. And you know, I'll do some with keep and stuff too, but I just wanted to ask you, cause it just came up to me. Are there, you know, and I know Keith has told me yes, but I want your answer. You know, are there actually times where, in addition to taking testosterone and a potential, you know, for guys, again, abusing uh, and, and, uh, and, 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 and angiotensin inhibitor, um, is there also a time to use estradiol, a very micro dose of estradiol? Yeah, there is. If someone has pathological or ge their genetics predispose it, if someone has an increased risk of prostate cancer, right. There is a reason for men to take oral estradiol. Dude, that's so amazing. They got, you just said, you did, what you just said is like literally an anthem to like the average doc who has no clue, right? Like they're saying, what did you just say? Well, I can tell them all they can, uh, you know, look at my tracks as I walk by. But the thing about it is <laughs> estradiol, oral estradiol has been used effectively to treat prostate cancer right. for years. Right. And no one grabs onto it. I know it's unbelievable, dude. I remember Neil lecturing about that four years ago and I was sitting there thinking, Jesus Christ, why is not everybody using estradiol? Instead, think of the drugs, Scott, that these poor bastards use where they become eunuchs. Like yeah. literally those drugs that they take make them dead while they're walking. Well, you know, uh, some of the protocols that Ruzier developed, uh, you can, after it's dropped for a certain amount, okay, and everything's like stabilized, you can increase testosterone back right. again with the estradiol. Right. And the thing about it is every time you give oral estradiol to a male, the lipid profile improves. Right. Like the amazing profile that a cardiologist right. wants to see. Right. Like Pang, Dr. Pang, his, he's went through uh, prostate cancer and his lipid profile is like the best male lipid profile i've ever seen in my life what is he the dosage what is the dosage of um of estradiol that he takes you know is it like one one milligram or two milligrams or something you know i don't know yeah i i thought it was sort of high when i first heard it right but i can't remember exactly what it was i mean in my mind it was high yeah i remember a Keith. Sending me, i remember Keith sending me his labs and show like how high his, his e2 level is and how amazing the healthy is and it's like you know again no estrogen symptoms <laughs> it shows Period. It shits all over people who think that, I mean, cause as you know, and we didn't cover this on the podcast, but why, we might as well keep going. Cause I'm going to make this two parts, but it's like, you know, so many guys have been baptized by the bro scientists and the T clinics, the windmill clinics, that there's a range, right. That they have to be in. And it's laughable because as you and I both know, and I say this time after time after time, but again, we're countering doctors, giving them bad insights that, the ranges weren't developed for men on therapeutic testosterone anyway. So it's like, they're completely useless. And it's as Keith has been saying forever, right? The minimum protective effect in women is 65, which is way outside of the range. So the, the, the misinformation dude is so prevalent and so widespread. And it, it takes you and obviously help with my help, pushing it out there to get this information to people so that they can actually wake up and realize that almost everything they've been fed about ranges and estrogen and therapeutic testosterone are thrown out the window now. Jay, I can tell you based on what I've learned, what I've searched out and learned and mapped out uh, to actually develop the genetic test, there is a 40 percent variation in man to man right literally based on their response to androgen therapy right now you look at a a, a guideline census okay it has a certain range a 40 percent addition or below of that completely nullifies it even travison in 2006 and niche lag in 2006 actually concluded in the results of their studies on the genetic part of polymorphism I'm talking about, that there is no normal reference range for any man today. It is predicated based off this polymorphism and it is a 40% variation. Unbelievable. How do, you, how do you actually just deny what's in the literature? Yeah. They, so here's the thing. These consensus guidelines give us no direction on how to treat individuals 
have had massive exposure to EDCs. Right. They give us no guidelines on treating anabolic steroid users. Right. They don't. So you're left just to uh, navigate that territory. Yeah, you're right. 100%. 100%. 100%. Okay, so if people want to work with you right now, they watch this podcast, um, they're desperate in need of help, you know, they're, you know, ashamed, whatever. They've never had anybody in the clinical space to actually help them. What's the best way they can reach out and connect with you? Uh, they can reach me at S Howell, H O W E L L S H O W E L L at tier one, numeral one, HW.com uh, or 423 417 1700. And I will respond to anybody that contacts me. I have about 10 guys I look after right now. And I will definitely um, I give you attention and tell you some basic things that you need to do, even if you don't sign up. It's, you know, um, my passion is to help. You. Right. It really is because I was in that space. And then I had to learn for myself how to protect my own health after I take, took those drugs and took them after, even after I learned better. So, right. you know, it's one of those things. I will help individuals. And like with um, the influencers, uh, uh, Dave Palumbo, uh, Pulowski, you know, we really need to get this information yeah. out because but I've known it for a long time and it has to go out to people. Yeah, no, you will, brother. I mean, trust me, after this is over uh, and I send it to my team, my crack staff, I'm going to send it to both of those guys. So they'll, they'll be seeing this in advance. And I, like I said, I'm going to rush this as soon as I can. So I appreciate you, brother, man. This is amazing. This has been like definitely the most informative podcast without question ever done on this information. And again, very needed and necessary to get into the hands of the uh, quote unquote bodybuilding and steroid abusing um, community. So again, man, I, I send you massive love. So guys, remember, uh, first off, please, um, you know, support the great people that come on this podcast. So you can find Scott at obviously at tier one HW.com. You can email him his, he just gave out his email. And of course, call him, which is in this podcast. will also be below in the information, but remember, raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. We will see you guys very, very soon.